Well, good morning. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um, pray for Kurt. His, uh, he, he and Tony are, uh, are brothers, but they've got the same voice this morning. It's hoarse, yeah. Yeah, really. Um, I've been asked to remind you to, if, if, if you can set your alarm a little early next Sunday and come to the 7 o'clock, because this service is probably going to be the one that a lot of folks attend. And so if some of you could come to 7, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. We'll be there. I'll right. be there, too. Yeah, yep. yeah. Okay. Be great if some of you are, too. <laughs> um, Kurt, next week we're not doing any announcements, obviously, during Easter, but what's happening the day after? So the day after Easter is when, uh, <clears throat> when we head out for, for Ireland. We'll leave, meet at the airport in Reno at 7 in the morning and then drive a van to San Francisco and then fly from San Francisco to uh, Dublin. Um, and then wow. we'll be there for seven days with Ben and Doreen working uh, primarily with uh, elementary school students, mm -hmm. um, opportunities to share the gospel and um, serve families and things like that. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, we want to pray for them because uh, uh, prayer is so important in any uh, missionary endeavor, whether it's here or anywhere else around the world. And they are going in Jesus' name, and they're representing us. And uh, I, I know that we, we follow what's going on with Ben and Doreen, and they're going to have a chance to actually go and participate. Um, yeah, last year you uh, had a group go out to the Czech Republic, and this year Ireland, and I understand, Lord willing, you want to keep up that all that alternate arrangement? That's the idea, is that uh, one year we would go serve with Ben and Doreen, and the next year we would head over and work with Josiah Venture um, on their exit tours. So, right. Yeah. With Kevin and Daniela. With Kevin and yeah. Daniela. That's, that's the vision. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do this morning is we'll be in Mark chapter 15, and we're looking at the necessity of Jesus' death and burial. Um, and as we, uh, as we look at this, we really want to kind of show... Uh, the, from God's side, why this was necessary? Why, why did why did Jesus need to die from where God is sitting? And then why did God or why did Jesus need to die from from where we're sitting? And what are the implications uh, for for everyone involved there? Um, and so when we talk about the the necessity of Jesus's death and burial, it really revolves around justice, mercy, love, and transformation. Uh, justice being uh, that God doesn't look at he looks at sin as a very serious thing. Um, and so what, what he doesn't do is he doesn't just sort of sweep sin under the rug and we'll deal, maybe we'll just kind of hide it. Um, but instead, it has to actually be dealt with. Um, and so God's justice is satisfied when Jesus dies on the cross. Uh, we see that in Romans, that in God's forbearance, that the sins of the, the people before the cross were covered by the cross, that they're dealt, not just covered, but dealt with by the cross, and that now we look back to the cross and realize that our sins are dealt with as well. So every sin of all mankind was dealt with on the cross, either before Jesus went there uh, in, the, in Old Testament times, or now looking back on it, every sin was dealt with by Jesus on the cross, and God's justice was completely satisfied when Jesus died, he paid the price in full. There's nothing left to do. Um, and boy, that's, that's, that's such a, a powerful takeaway because in our world, it's so easy to rationalize sin and to minimize it right. and, uh, and to do exactly what you're talking about, sweep it under the rug. Right, right, right. Rather, than, rather than genuinely deal yeah. with it. And then when we talk about mercy, mercy is uh, withholding punishment that is due. So somebody is deserved punishment and it's withheld. Um, so with the cross, Jesus, he, God withheld the punishment that, that we were due and actually laid it upon Jesus. So God is he's just, but he's merciful. And we also see God's love very clearly here that he would be willing to give his life on our behalf, that he would die for us, for our sins and in our place to bring us back into relationship with him. His love is very clearly seen on the cross. And then when we talk about transformation, uh, Jesus' death and burial doesn't leave us where we were. Um, it doesn't leave me in the state of a sinner who can only sin. It doesn't leave me in a place where I don't have the ability to please God anymore. Uh, it, it, it transforms me. And so this is, a, this is a huge thing that God is satisfied with what takes place on the cross, but so am I. 
Um, God is, his justice and his mercy uh, and his love are shown to me. And because of that, the tra- a transformation can take place to me. So God is satisfied and I'm lifted up and so am I. And it's a beautiful thing that takes place uh, as we look at the cross. Uh, Don, would you read 33 through, uh, what are we going to do at first? 41. 41. Yeah. Sure. When the sixth hour came, that's uh, noon, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, behold, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less and Joseph, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Is that you or me? I don't know. I pushed mute over here. I, I literally pushed mute. Well, it must have been me. It must have been you. Okay, sorry. Uh, geez, Don. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in these first, uh, these first four verses, 33 through 37, well, we see that Jesus bore the full wrath of God, and out of God's mercy, he withheld the punishment that we deserved and placed it on Jesus. Uh, so as, as you look at this, 33 says, when the sixth hour came, Uh, darkness fell over the land until the ninth hour. So from noon to three, uh, a time of the day that's typically pretty bright, right? That's when you wear your sunglasses. It's dark. Um, And and this darkness was a supernatural darkness. And the people of the time, uh, uh, from a Greek mindset, they would have have understood this kind of darkness as a great man was dying. Uh, Many of the poets wrote that there was, uh, it was dark when, or it was literally or figuratively dark when a great man died. And so from a Greek mindset, that's what they would have understood that a great man was dying. From a Jewish mindset, darkness was uh, was, uh, um, equated with God's wrath and judgment. So the the Greeks go, a great man is dying. The, The Jewish people go, God is judging sin. And, uh, and, and, and his wrath is being poured out here. Um, and so you have those two kind of mindsets there where a great man is dying, but also God's wrath uh, and his justice are being carried out right now. Mm-hmm. And that's really what the darkness is about. And it wasn't just kind of like a, a figurative darkness. It was a supernatural, literal darkness. Um, it, was a dark de- it was a dark day. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, verse 34, the ninth hour, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think that what's really important to grab hold of here is, uh, is Jesus is feeling the wrath of God. Um, he's, he's, he's experiencing becoming sin on our behalf. He's experiencing something that he, from his father that he'd never felt before. Um, all of a sudden, this sinless one takes on sin, and he feels wrath from his father, and he's beginning to experience the distance that is to come between him and his father that's never been there before. Right? As we've gone through this, we've talked about, I mean, the physical agony was obviously there. The mental agony was obviously there. But the emotional side of this, of being pulled away from his father, that's what he's expressing here. He's feeling the distance that's coming between him and God, his father, and, and, and he's never experienced that before. Um, and, and that's really what's being expressed here. And that's what Jesus dreaded in the garden, was this uh, separation from his father. We all were born separated because of our sin, and, and we uh, have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Jesus and the father were always one. And so here, when he says, my God, he's showing, wow, there is a separation for the the first and the only time, the only time ever. Right. And we also see that uh, what this is a quote uh, from Psalm, uh, is it Psalm 22, right? 22. 22. Yeah. Yeah, And and, uh, at this point, Jesus's energy is probably not great, Um, but, uh, you know, he's he's been through so much, and so... uh, 
he only quotes one line of the psalm, not, not the entire psalm. And probably the reason for that is at that point in time, if, if you quoted a single line, many people would have understand that you were referencing the entire psalm. Um, and I believe that, uh, you know, that psalm was written by King David. It was written in a time where he felt distance between him and God. He felt as though uh, wrath was on him. Um, and, uh, well, and, and not only that, but uh, one of the most amazing, amazing things is that King David wrote this in 1000 B.C. Crucifixion wasn't even invented. It wasn't even practiced for another 300 years. And it was another thousand years until this moment and uh as as you said when when jesus quoted from psalm 22 those listening had they thought about it would think of the entire psalm which details what it was like to be crucified right well before it was ever invented mm -hmm. yeah so you have the fulfillment of uh, of prophecy here as well um but uh but mostly what you see there is jesus experiencing the wrath of god Really what was due to us, a, a, a brokenness of relationship, all of a sudden he's taking that on our behalf. Um, verse 35 says, when some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, behold, he's calling for Elijah. Uh, so they misunderstand what he's saying and think, oh, he, he must be calling for Elijah. Um, verse 36 says, someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, gave it to him to drink, saying, uh, let's see whether Elijah will come and take him down. So they run and they grab this sponge and they fill it with sour wine. Uh, I did some reading about this sour wine. It was actually a mixture of water, egg, and vinegar. Uh, the Greek word is, uh, th for this wine is sharp. You can imagine why they would have come up with that. That sounds like I don't want to drink it. Um, but it was a soldier's drink, and it was a drink that they took for, for energy. Um, it, it not only uh, um, hydrated them, but it gave them energy. And so that's what they give Jesus here. They give him something that's going to kind of energize him um, and, and, and help him go a little bit further here. Um, and, and so, and, and really, the, they want to see what's, what's he going to do. Uh, get him this sour wine. Get him what it takes so he can have a little more energy. We want to see what he's going to do here. Um, will Elijah come and take him down? And verse 37 says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. Uh, so he, he, he utters a loud cry. Um, Luke talks about what he says here. He basically commits his, his, uh, his spirit into the Father's hands. Um, he trusts himself to God uh, that, that the Father will do what is right and what is good. Um, and, uh, and the way that he dies here is different. It says that he breathed his last. That was not a normal phrase that they would have used for someone who was dying. And really what we see with Jesus is that it was, it was his, his life was his to give when he was ready to give it. Um, and uh, he made the choice right here that this is, I'm ready, it's finished uh, I'll give my life now. And no one, no one had, before or since has died like Jesus died. Because Jesus didn't have to die. We all, uh, again, we, when we die, it's because we have sinned. And, uh, you know, we're, we're redeemed. We're no longer sinners by nature. But the, our bodies are the last thing that's left to be redeemed. Jesus didn't have to die. But he had authority from his father to lay down his life. That's what he said in John 10. He said, I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I've received from my father. So this was a moment unlike any. In, in history. Yeah, and I think it's important to grab hold of that there was no redemption process that Jesus needed to go through. We, we all need to go through a redemption process. We are owned by, by sin and we are slaves to it. And we need to be redeemed from that, right? Uh, somebody needs to pay the price to buy us out of that lifestyle and out of that market to, to sin and, and, and redeem us, buy us out of it and make us something different. Jesus did not need to go through that redemption process. But instead, he is the one who pays for our redemption here. He's the one who becomes sin our, on our behalf. He takes the full wrath of God that we deserved. And, and because of that, God's justice is satisfied. And because of that, God is able to buy us out of sin and redeem us and free us. And, but Jesus didn't need to go through that process. No. There was no need for him to die for his own redemption. He died for 
our redemption. And I think that's really important to grab hold of is that he, there, was, there was no need for Jesus to die of his own accord. He died for us, right. 100% for this us. This is as personal as it gets. Right, yeah. right. Uh, verse 38 and 39, uh, we see that Jesus accomplished what no one else could have because of who he is. His love saves us and his grace transforms us. Um, you see here that uh, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus utters a loud cry, he breathes his last, and the veil of the temple is torn in two. Uh, the veil of the temple, they said it took 300 priests to hang it. This thing is humongous, it's heavy, uh, it's thick, it's made of the finest uh, materials that they could get. Um, and what the veil symbolized was, was a separation between man and God. So the veil's there on the opposite side is the Holy of Holies where God's, the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence is. And, and the high priest would enter that uh, basically once a year on the, on the day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He would go in there, he'd sprinkle blood for the sins of the nation. And it was very limited access to God. So this, this symbolism of limited access is torn in two. And it's not just partially, not just a little tear, but from top to bottom, it's ripped in half. And the symbolism is huge of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Hebrews talks about how we can approach the, th the throne of God with boldness because it's open, right? Because Jesus has done what it takes for us to be able to do that, it's torn in two. We have intimate access to our Father that didn't exist before. But Jesus has purchased us that and transformed us to the place where we can approach our Father in that manner. Um, and, and just like it's, it's easy to minimize sin, it's also easy to, to minimize or even take for granted that transformation and that access that we have. Right, right. And Jesus has done everything it takes to redeem us from sin and also to uh, transform us into children of the, of, of the one true king who now we can approach his throne with boldness. That is not something you would do before. You imagine being a rebel against a king and walking to his throne with boldness. That's not going to end well, right? But Jesus has now purchased us out of rebellion and brought us into relationship with the Father. And there's a there's a complete transformation that's taken place. He doesn't look at me as a rebel anymore. He looks at me as his son. And that's why I can approach him in this way. Not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus has secured for me. Um, and that, that is an amazing fact that we have that. Uh, verse 39, when the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Uh, so this guy who is on crucifixion detail, uh, he's seen... Usually the soldiers that did that, they didn't just kind of get assigned to it once or twice. It was sort of what they did. Um, and it was not a great detail. Nobody wanted to be uh, uh, taking care of crucifixion. Many times what would happen with people is they would hang on the cross for days. And these people are insurrectionists. They're people who have fought against Rome. And so uh, they would have to watch them day and night. So there'd be, there'd be a, uh, some soldiers there that were responsible for making sure that somebody didn't come and take this guy down off the cross. It was dangerous work. Nobody wanted to do this. But he had seen many people die. And the way that Jesus die, died left him in a place where he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. And that is such a huge statement. Truly, Jesus was the Son of God. And what you have to understand is that in, in all history, there's never been anyone alive that could pay for your sin other than Jesus. You can't pay for your sin. I can't pay for your sin. The greatest man in history can't pay for your sin. Nobody can do it except for Jesus. It was an infinite death, or in, infinite debt, and it took an infinite God to pay it. The, the debt is insurmountable. It's, whatever our national debt is, it's not enough. It's bigger. It's, it's, your sin is greater than that. It's eternal. It's an eternal debt, and it took an eternal being to pay it. You have to understand, nobody else could pay this price. And we admire uh, people who sacrifice their life for others. Uh, think of that gendarme who uh, um, took the place of the, the woman just uh, a couple days ago in France, and, and he was killed by, the, uh, by that terrorist. And, and he's a national hero, and as well he should be. But even that noble sacrifice could not take away sin. Right. There may be somebody who's capable of saving your life in a temporal way. There's a doctor who can save you from cancer. There's a, uh, there's a, so, there's a policeman who can save you from a villain. You know, there, there's somebody who can save you. There are many people who can save you from temporal death. There's no one that can, that can, that can save you other than Jesus from eternal separation from the Father. 
So there, certainly there are heroes on this earth who have given their lives to protect others, but no one has ever given their lives to pay for sin. Nobody else has done that except for Jesus because nobody else was capable of doing it. Um, and I think that's, that's something you have to take away from this. Truly, this man was the Son of God. Jesus did what it took to save us. Um, and then in verse 40 and 41, you see um, there were some women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and the and Valesa and Joseph. Uh, when, when he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. The, the big thing to take away from here is that eyewitnesses took this in. Uh, this isn't some fabrication that somebody came up with later. Uh, somebody didn't make up the story of Jesus being crucified and, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And somebody didn't make up the fact that they didn't break his legs, but they broke the, the other two criminals' legs. Somebody didn't make up the fact that they pierced his side with a spear. The eyewitnesses saw this whole thing. And, and, and so this isn't some fairy tale that somebody came up with to make Jesus God. They're eyewitnesses that watched it take place. And that's true, the, not just here, but the entire gospel accounts. They're eyewitness accounts. And, and the gospel writers took the time to write them down for us so that we could understand who Jesus was, what Jesus did, and that this is a historical thing that took place. Uh, that's huge. The, the Jesus that we read about is the Jesus of history. Uh, he, he literally lived. He literally died. You have to grab onto that. This is who Jesus is. And one of the most amazing things as we look at the, the rest of the passage, uh, one of the most amazing things about God is that he takes the evil actions of people that hate him and he turns them on their head and accomplishes his purpose. In other words, nothing and no one can stop God from working. And I think we see that even in these events that follow Jesus' death and, and uh, go through his, his burial. Um, why don't you read verses 42 and 43? Okay. When evening had, or excuse me, when, e when evening had already come, because it was the day of preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea came, a prominent member of the council, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God and he gathered up courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, each of the gospel accounts, I like to look at them as, uh, as intersecting circles, like a, a Venn diagram where you see the, the circles intersect. And they're, they're, they intersect, they, they harmonize, but each one contains its own unique details. Now, Mark was writing to a non-Jewish audience. And so he includes some details that, for instance, Matthew, who is writing to Jews, he, he wouldn't even think of including. Uh, for instance, the preparation day. All Jews knew that was the day to get ready for the Sabbath when no work was done. And this was a particularly important uh, preparation day. In fact, it was the day before the Passover. So Jesus died at, at 3 p.m., that Friday. And so the events that we're looking at here occurred in a window between 3 p.m. and sundown. And it's interesting. I just kind of stopped to think about last night. I wonder when the sun shone again. Mm. It doesn't say. My guess is when the veil opened and mm. the, the sacrifice had been paid. But anyway, any rate, here's, here's this window. And it's, it's ironic that the Jewish leaders, they wanted the bodies off the crosses. Normally, bodies of, of criminals would hang there, and they'd just fall off from decay or be eaten by wild animals. But since it was the Passover, it, it was ironic that they, it was okay that they sentenced an innocent man to death, but they wanted the bodies off uh, the cross for Passover. Um, and Jesus' body would have been discarded just like the other two thieves with which he was crucified in a common grave, in a pit in the ground, had not Joseph intervened. Now, Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin. Uh, Mark calls it the council. That was the Gentile name for it. He was a wealthy man who, along with Nicodemus, it says they both were waiting for the kingdom of God. Now, that phrase indicates that they were trusting that God would send the Messiah to Israel. And they had come to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. 
However, they sat on the council when Jesus was condemned to death. They abstained. They said nothing as the, as the rest of the council condemned him to death as they, they beat him and, and sent him on his way to Pontius Pilate. But yet a complete transformation took place in these two men's lives in just a matter of hours. Uh, after Jesus had died, Joseph here steps up and, and boldly asks Pilate for the body of Jesus. He is, he is not content to be a hidden follower any longer. Now, I kind of wonder, but what is it that causes people to step up like that? You know, he, he went from believing but yet hiding his belief to now being bold in his expression of faith. Yeah, and I think there's two key phrases in, the, in those verses. <clears throat> um, it says that uh, you mentioned one of them, uh, that uh, he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. It, it demonstrates that he had faith in God, and he had trust in the scriptures, and he believed that God was going to act. Um, he had also witnessed Jesus' life, right? He, he'd seen, the, or at very least he'd heard of the miracles, um, but probably seen the miracles that Jesus performed. At very least had heard about him, uh, had heard the, the words that Jesus had preached, had spent some time actually around Jesus, uh, very likely may even have seen him die here. Mm -hmm. um, he may have been at the crucifixion. And, 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 and so he comes to a place where he goes, that's the Messiah. And he just died. And there was enough evidence in the Old Testament to understand that, there, that the Messiah would give his life. Yeah. right? And so he reaches a point where based upon the truth that he has and the faith that he has in God's plan, he musters up courage. And that's what you see here. I love that phrase. He gathered up courage mm -hmm. and went before Pilate. I think those two things are huge. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. He believed that God was going to act. He had faith in who God is, the plan that God had revealed. And because of that faith, he mustered up, he gathered up courage to go do what was right. And I think that's true of our lives too. We have to have the background. There has to be inside of our minds and inside of our hearts the truth of who God is and the truth of what God is doing. And then because we know that truth, and, and as New Testament believers, New Covenant believers, because of the Spirit of God that dwells within us, we then move based upon the truth that we have. Yeah. It doesn't have... Change in our lives doesn't have to take months or years. God right. can work pretty fast. Right. So, um, why don't you read verses 44 and 45? Mm -hmm. Turn to the right page. Uh, 44. Pilate wondered if he was dead by this time, and summoning the centurion, he questioned him as to whether he was already dead. And ascertaining this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Now, again, Psalm 76, verse 10 says... Even the wrath of man will praise you. In other words, the, the evil thoughts and intentions of people that hate God will be turned on their, their head, and that will end up praising God. And so here's Pilate, you know, sentenced Jesus to death. And um, he ends up establishing one of the first points of the gospel, and that is that Christ died. I mean, this is the, the equivalent of a first century coroner's report. Um, he was surprised that Jesus was already dead because, as Kurt says, uh, death by crucifixion usually took days, not hours. And so he summoned the centurion, the chief executioner. This guy knew what death looked like. And uh, the details of how the centurion verified that Jesus was dead uh, are spelled out in John 19, verses 31 through 37. We're not going to go there now, but I'll paraphrase it. Um, this crucifixion was devilish. I mean, it, it, it just was meant as torture. Uh, the, a, a man crucified would hang, the, the weight of his body would be hanging off the nails in his hands, and, and it would cause him to begin to suffocate. And so in order to breathe, he would have to push off and catch his breath he'd have to push off against the nails in his feet. And so it was just constant, constant agony. Now, the soldier saw that Jesus was already dead. The other two thieves were still alive. And so the centurion commanded that their legs be broken. Once that happened, they couldn't push up any longer and they died by suffocation uh, pretty quickly. John mentions that 
A soldier pierced Jesus' side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And so much has been written about that. Uh, it, it's kind of amazing. But two entries in, in two different medical journals just kind of hit it on the head. It's very, very simple. When a person dies, blood coagulates within 15 minutes. And so John made a big point saying that what he saw... Uh, it, what he saw so that you could believe. It was just another proof that Jesus was dead. And um, Pilate granted the body of Jesus to Joseph. Uh, he didn't demand a bribe, and maybe there was a little twinge of conscience there. Maybe Pilate realized, okay, I'll allow this guy to have a prophet, proper burial because I sentenced him to death even though he was innocent. And Without anyone knowing it, anyone knowing it, the, those two actions, the fact that Jesus' legs weren't broken and his side was pierced, fulfilled two more scriptures about the death of the Messiah. And uh, we see God at work even in the darkest hour of history. And um, I'm sure each of us can think of a time when it was a dark time in our lives and we saw God at work. And... Uh, I think back 32 years ago, my mom passed away. It doesn't seem that long ago, you know? Uh, time just doesn't seem to matter when someone you love passes. And, and she, we lived in Oregon at the time, and she quick, suddenly fell into a coma. Uh, my dad still lives in New Jersey, and I was able to travel back and see her. And she was unresponsive, but they had her hooked up to a heart monitor, and when I spoke with her, her heart rate would increase. And it was just, just a little blessing that uh, uh, she knew I was there. You know, God was at work, even in that really dark moment. Yeah. I had a similar experience with my grandmother when she passed away. But uh, what, what really comes to mind more, more with my grandmother was the dark time in my life when I, when I had walked away from the Lord and was sort of making decisions of, apart from what we just talked about, not based upon truth, not based upon faith. Um, she later on showed me uh, a prayer journal that she kept during that time where she was writing these prayers for me. Um, and, and so sometimes, sometimes we might not ex see exactly what God is doing in our dark hours. Uh, we might not understand everything that he's doing in that moment, um, but, but you have to understand the love of God. And even here it is, the darkest moment, per, per, <laughs> it would look like the darkest moment, Jesus' death. And yet in that, he's accomplishing everything that could ever need to be accomplished. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's, that's the beauty of the gospel. Evil did not stop God from uh, being at work, even here. And, and so this favor that Pilate granted to Joseph established the second point of the gospel. Christ died, and he was buried. And uh, again, he wasn't, he wasn't going to be buried unless Joseph had uh, summoned up the courage and intervened. And even that fulfilled a prophecy by Isaiah, where it says in Isaiah 53, his grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. Amazing. And um, could you read verses 46 to 47? Yeah. Joseph brought a linen cloth, took him down, wrapped him in the linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of a rock. And he rolled the stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were looking on to see where he was laid. So again, in that 3 p.m. to sunset uh, window of time, they did not have much time to work. Obviously, uh, Joseph and Nicodemus had been speaking. And uh, it, John, the in the Gospel of John, it says Nicodemus showed up with 75 pounds of spices. Now... Um, a sack of cement weighs 50 pounds. That's one and a half sacks of cement worth of spices that they, they used in, uh, in the burial of Jesus. Now, they had to work quickly. Uh, so Joseph and Nicodemus took Jesus' body off of the cross, transported it to uh, Joseph's tomb, which was hewn right in the side of the hill. It was carved out of solid rock. And there... Uh, according to Jewish custom, they would have washed his body and then wrapped it from the armpits down to the ankles in strips of linen about a foot 
wide. I, I was going to bring one and, and demonstrate on you. But, uh, <laughs> and they, they would use the spices. Some of the spices were sticky and some were powdery. And the sticky spices were used to glue those strips of linen together. And then they would spread the, the powdery ones in there. And it wasn't embalming like the Egyptians. Instead, it was more like a deodorant. And uh, they would wrap the whole body, then wrap his head separately and put a, a, a shroud or a, a, a big piece of linen over the entire body. Mm-hmm. And uh, now you would think that then a, then a big stone was pushed to, to block the entrance of the tomb. It, it slid in its own groove or channel and it slid downhill into place. And so you would think that would be secure enough, Right. A, a, a grave in solid rock with a huge stone uh, over the entrance. But that wasn't enough. Jesus' grave was triply sealed. The Jewish leaders, the disciples had forgotten that he had said he was going to rise from the dead, but the Jewish leaders remembered. And so they asked Pilate for a guard. And that would have been at least four soldiers so that two could remain uh, awake and two asleep at any time. And so there were soldiers outside of the the tomb. Not only that, there was a rope that was stretched across the entrance, uh, sealed with a big glob of wax that had the imperial seal of Rome. If that was broken, it would mean death, not only for the person who did it, but for the guards. So sealed three ways. And that proved that Jesus was buried. uh, There would have been no no guards, no seal, if Jesus' body wasn't in the tomb. The religious leaders wouldn't have cared if Jesus' body wasn't there. Amazing. Proof of the uh, second big point of the gospel. And and then there were, uh, in verse 47, those women who had been witnesses, eyewitnesses to to Jesus' crucifixion. And, And As it said earlier, they were the ones who'd served Jesus. Now, it's really important to remember, they they just took care of him. They they made sure he was fed, that his clothes were clean and and well-mended. And it was, they loved him, but not in any weird kind of way. And we live in a time where I'm sure you can think of two or three people right off the top of your head, religious leaders, right, who use their charisma to gather basically a harem for their own gratification. It would be completely wrong to take that perversion and assign that to what is happening here. Jesus uh, and these women, I mean, they were just serving him. Right. Yeah, so later on, one of the Gnostic Gospels uh, fabricates a... uh uh, a relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene, and then you know later on, this is where we get the Dan Brown stuff and all the um, I can't remember the name of those movies, the Da Vinci Code and all that stuff. It, it, it's it's all that's gathered from a later gospel um, that was that had no eyewitness accounts. Here we're talking about eyewitness accounts. Right. You're talking about complete fabrication later, um, and then later on, you know, in our time, Dan Brown grabs a hold of that. We get the Da Vinci Code, and you get all these people that go, oh, the Holy Grail's Jesus is lineage and it's just baloney. Yeah, nonsense yeah total baloney now a- as we as we wrap this up it, it's important to i mean this is as personal as it gets because jesus as you said didn't have to die he died in our place personally and the the facts are so clear that he died and he was buried and got to think of what, what the significance is that, uh, of that for our lives. Right. So we talk about two things leading into this, that, that God was satisfied by the, the cross. The, the, the wrath and justice of God was satisfied by the cross. He looked at what Jesus offered and gave and paid, and Jesus cried out, it's finished, it's paid in full. So God is completely satisfied by the cross. The flip side of that is what about you and me? What does this do for me? Right? And so when we talk about Jesus' death, uh, you look at Romans 6 and 7, and it talks about how we're placed into Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. And in that, we, ha- we come to realize that there's a fundamental change that's taken place inside of me because of what Jesus did. Uh, I'm not who I was anymore. I know who I was before I started following Jesus and before I trusted the, 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 in the cross and in his death and in his burial and his resurrection. I know who I was then, and, and I wouldn't go back for anything. 
I wouldn't go back to that state of trying to muster up the strength on my own. I wouldn't go back to failure and, and trying to strive for what is right but not having the strength to do it. I wouldn't go back to that for anything. Because I understand the transformation that has taken place in me. I understand the life that God has given me. Uh, and I'm not who I was anymore. I'm no longer a sinner by nature. I'm no longer a part of Adam's race. But I've, I've become a saint by nature. And I'm, I'm a part of the family of God. There's a fundamental transformation that's taken place in me. And I didn't do anything to get it. And Jesus paid it all. He gave it to me. And I wouldn't go back for anything. And, and that's true whether we feel that way or not. Right. And sometimes we don't feel like we're new people but jesus death and burial just like the facts of jesus death and burial are are irrefutable the same goes for each one of us we died with christ and have been buried with him and so that nature to sin is dead and gone period and uh, now we can be tempted by the same stuff that we were tempted by uh prior to knowing jesus but it's not our nature to, to follow those temptations anymore. And we do have a choice. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, this is a big takeaway, is that the reality of Jesus' death and burial are, are realities for each of us. Yeah. And uh, we want to remember the, uh, we want to conclude our time together this morning by remembering that the, the personal nature of Jesus' death for each one of us. And, and we're going to do so by uh, observing the Lord's Supper. Now, this is, is a time meant for uh, believers, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Um, it, it, just two things are, are uh, asked by, um, by Scripture that we, we follow. One is that we have trusted Jesus Christ. Uh, as the only way to be right with God. Um, you could trust him right now. Right. Yeah. yeah. If, if you haven't, you could trust him right now and, and partake. The other is that there is no area in your life where you are just saying, God, that is off limits. That's mine. That's private property. There's no area of sin that you're practicing. There, there's no area where you're saying, uh-uh, to God. If there is, if, if the Holy Spirit reveals something like that to you, deal with it. That's, that's the point. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, let a, a person examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 